This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, and that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love, but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So I love stories, and we can learn a lot from stories. And besides telling stories, it's just plain fun, right? It's our way of making sense of the world. When we share stories, we learn from each other. And I had a wonderful time fishing and telling stories last weekend uh, we had five folks from our church that went to the Men in Boats uh, fishing retreat, along with uh, Hope Lutheran over in Fargo. They're the ones that sponsor this event, but there were many, many different churches there. And we went there uh, a week ago Friday, and then fished all day Saturday, and then came home on Sunday. And it was an opportunity to gather together. There was 115 of us that were there, and we had an opportunity to, to worship and fish. It was just an amazing time. And my favorite part was sharing fishing stories with all of these uh, folks there. So I got to regale them about my uh, opportunity that I had when I caught a 38-inch muskie just a few weeks ago. Uh, if you want to see the picture, come talk to me uh, after, after worship. I'll be more than happy to share it with you. And uh, our group did very well. Uh, we had five of us, and uh, we each got our limit of walleye. Uh, we went to a lake called Dry Lake, just north of Devil's Lake. The main gathering was in Devil's Lake. And I knew I was going to have a good day fishing when I casted my line out using a slip bobber and a leech. And I kid you not, within 10 seconds, I had a walleye at the end of my line. It was an amazing time. And we shared stories after stories, fishing stories. But even more importantly, we shared stories of faith. And I learned so much during that time from all of the men gathered at this men in boats fishing retreat. And we're going to do it again next year, so uh, please consider it. We also ate lots and lots of wonderful food as well. 
So our gospel that we have for today is also an amazing story, a story that happened a long time ago, but it's a story that we can learn a lot from, and it's a story that can inform us for how we can live life as baptized children of God in this modern age. And so let's dive in to this amazing story. There is a lot here to unpack. So we have this Pharisee in our story who goes by the name of Simon, and he invites Jesus to his house for dinner. It's really interesting to see Jesus kind of eats his way through the Gospel of Luke. It seems like Jesus is always eating. My guess is that Simon is pretty well off because he's having this big dinner party. All sorts of people are there, all these learned people, and Jesus is also invited to this party. Then out of the blue, this random woman shows up, and she is obviously unwelcome and uninvited. She's not supposed to be there, and Simon, you can only imagine, is probably a little upset with this woman. And she shows up and brings a jar of perfumed ointment, and she makes a big commotion of weeping and bathing Jesus's feet and wiping them with her hair. And she rubs this ointment on Jesus' feet and kisses them as well. And we get to observe Simon's thoughts during this, whole, during this whole scene. And it is clear that Simon has formed uh, an opinion of this woman already from what he has heard about her. He not only thinks badly of this woman, but he also kind of thinks badly of Jesus as well because he's allowing her, himself to be touched by this woman. Then finally, after all of these actions, Jesus finally speaks in verse 40. When Jesus does speak, he doesn't just come out with his thoughts. He uses a parable. He uses a story. He used every moment as a teaching moment. And if you recall, a parable is a story that teaches us something about us or something about God. So Jesus tells this parable or story about a banker who forgives the loans of two people who can't pay him back. There's one guy who owes a really, really big sum that would be about a year and a half of wages. The other guy owes him also a large sum, but maybe equal to about a month or two of wages. Both loans are nothing to sneeze at. And it is very uncommon for a banker just to say, you know, I see you're having a hard time with that debt. Let me just wipe that out for you. That's pretty unlikely. I wish my banker would say that to me. Just, that's okay, we'll just wipe that out for you. But you know, banks wouldn't make any money if they did that, if they let everybody off the hook. Jesus was a good teacher. Because he told this story, told this parable, then he asked Simon if he understands the meaning. Who would love the banker more? Simon says that the guy who had the bigger debt forgiven would love the banker more. Then Jesus, still in teacher mode, applies the story to a real-life situation. He contrasts the generosity of Simon and this sinful woman. Simon didn't offer to have Jesus' feet cleaned after coming in from a dusty walk. But the woman washed Jesus' feet with her own tears. Imagine that. Simon didn't greet Jesus with a kiss, but the woman kissed Jesus' feet. Simon didn't put oil on Jesus' head, but the woman rubbed perfumed ointment into Jesus' well-traveled, cracked feet. These rituals may seem odd to us, but they were not odd in that culture. People wore sandals, and their feet were their main mode of transportation. Imagine that, living without cars and having to walk everywhere you go. And it was a very kind gesture to offer to wash someone's feet or to give them a foot rub. And also in that culture, people greeted one another with kisses on the cheek, much like people greet each other in France or in Latin America. My wife and I lived in Brazil, and I never got used to that. Men and women would greet each other with three kisses. You would start on one side, you'd kiss, kiss, kiss. 
And I got to be known as the guy that doesn't like to kiss. So it was always kind of funny. People would always laugh at me when I attempted to greet one another with a kiss. I guess I'm just a part of the frozen chosen here in the Midwest, where we usually greet one another with a handshake. Or if you're really outgoing, we might, we might hug each other, maybe do a side hug or something like that. And also this whole notion of putting oil on people's heads, if we would try to do that in our culture, people would probably get a little upset. But that was a sign of great respect back in uh, this time. So I don't think we have an equivalent to this kind of hospitality in our culture. Once again, uh, if someone comes over to our house, we invite them in, we shake their hand. Maybe we would take their coat if it's 20 below zero outside. We'd show them to a chair in the living room and maybe even bring them something to drink. And in my house, I probably would give you a cinnamon roll to enjoy. The host Simon just gave Jesus a normal amount of hospitality. He invited Jesus in and invited him to the table, but Simon didn't go out of his way to show him hospitality. This woman, on the other hand, went overboard. She went out of her way in showing gratitude and in showing hospitality. She didn't just wash Jesus' feet with water, but with her very own tears. She didn't get a towel to dry them. She used her own hair. And then she also kissed Jesus and gave him a foot robe. Those actions might make us uncomfortable, but they were a part of their culture. And the woman in our story, the woman is going out of her way to show gratitude. So then Jesus continues the teaching moment by saying why this woman was acting this way. He tells Simon that she was a big sinner, but she has experienced true forgiveness. She was like the debtor who was forgiven the really, really big loan. She was given such a heaping, helping dose of forgiveness, and so she was really, really grateful because of it. Jesus then tells the whole group sitting around the table that her sins are forgiven, and he tells her, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Perhaps this woman came to the dinner party knowing that Jesus had the power to forgive her, and she acted out of her gratitude before he even said anything to her. So I've got a few questions for you. Question number one, what do you think Simon's reaction to this teaching moment was? And don't worry, I'm not going to go around and have you report on that question. I, I kind of answer the question this way. He probably didn't like that Jesus says that this woman was showing more hospitality than he was. And I'm willing to bet that he probably didn't like that Jesus said that she was able to love more because she had forgiven more. He probably thought he was showing as much love as he needed to show. And my guess would be is that he was probably mad because Jesus, well, Jesus was messing with the categories that he was living by. Certain people are acceptable, and certain people are not acceptable. That's just the way it is. Those are the categories that Simon was living with. And I think that we have those moments when we are like Simon the Pharisee. I know I am guilty of that. I have those moments. We all put people into different categories. And when a label is slapped on you or a category, you can't get away. And soon the dividing line between certain kinds of people is set in stone and is followed for generations. And we're all guilty of doing this. For some reason, we need to label people. Maybe it gives us control in an out-of-control world that we live in. We try so hard to put people into different categories. There are good, upstanding people, and there are people with bad reputations who don't amount to much. There are upstanding people and not-so-upstanding people. We like to know what category to put people into. I think sometimes that's why it can be really hard to meet people sometimes. We don't know where they fit in, and so we don't know how to treat them. So my next question, this is a thinking question, but don't worry. 
I will not go around and ask you individually to, this, to respond to this question. What labels have you carried with you? What labels have you put on other people? Simon even puts a label on Jesus. He thinks Jesus is a faulty prophet. Imagine that. Because Jesus doesn't treat this woman the way everyone else does. He thinks that a real prophet would know better. But Jesus knows exactly who he is dealing with. Jesus actually knows the heart of Simon and the heart of the woman better than they know themselves. And Jesus looked at both of them in a way that removed all of the stereotypes and preconceptions. Isn't that amazing? Jesus brought into question the whole labeling system that we use. And he used a secret weapon to level the playing field between a person like Simon and a person like that woman. Jesus leveled the playing field by offering forgiveness. It's funny how we talk about forgiveness, but we don't always necessarily live it. I'm guilty of that. If we truly lived the forgiven life, we wouldn't be so inclined to keep labels and stereotypes alive. The truth is that forgiveness, it's a really, really, really powerful thing. It messes up business as usual. There isn't much separating Simon and that woman. He was just as sinful as she was, but he didn't necessarily realize, realize it. He didn't think he was in need of forgiveness as much as that woman thought that she was in need of forgiveness. And so he didn't live graciously like the woman did in this story. She knew that she didn't deserve a second chance. And when she got it, well, she was really grateful, and she acted out of that gratitude. She didn't care about the rules or the boundaries anymore. She crashed a party just to show gratitude to Jesus. We as the church, we are supposed to be people who have received great forgiveness and grace. But we're human. We're all human, right? So we are the people who should be the most grateful and loving and forgiving. But so often we take that for granted. Again, we're human. We're still humans, after all. In our humanness, we can sometimes act like there is nothing to be grateful for. And we don't treat each other with love. Sometimes people don't attend church anymore because they see church as Simon the Pharisee. Sometimes people see us as people who reinforce the categories that Jesus tried to break down. But we come to church every Sunday and receive, for and receive forgiveness. But then sometimes we put it in our pockets or under our hats and forget about it. But let's not forget about the great power of forgiveness. Let's go out into the world and tell people that they're forgiven. It's an amazing thing. Let's wear forgiveness everywhere we go. This story is so powerful because it is about what happens next, after being forgiven. When we truly get how amazing forgiveness is, we live differently. When we realize that there is nothing so special about us, that it doesn't matter what side of the tracks that you are on or what label you are stuck with. The only thing that levels the playing field is God's forgiveness. Wow. That's something that I am in awe of. This story, this parable is a teaching moment about how we can live as people who are forgiven. Chock full of gratitude, chock full of love, and chock full of forgiveness. So I challenge all of us to notice what types of labels that we put on others and what labels we put on ourselves. Are they helpful? Are they destructive? And how might the reality of God's forgiveness change how you live? Think about it. And then remember this. Remember that you are a beloved child of God, a baptized child of God, and a forgiven child of God. And we have a lot to be grateful for. This is all very, very good news. Amen.